Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent licensed in all 50 states. I'm so glad that you joined us on all major podcast platforms, or if you are aggressively watching us on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, I have a repeat guest today because everyone keeps asking, when's Tom coming back on? I want to hear Tom. And I don't blame him because he is the most sought after speaker in the annuity industry. Unfortunately, he's uh you know, he walks the walk on this thing. He believes in transfer risk. He believes in lifetime income. And that means that he is transitioning into chapter two of his life. But he has got so much to say, and I'm so glad to have him on. Tom Hegna, welcome back to Fun with the Hey, East. Stan, great to be back with you. I'm, I'm coming to you from uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. That's where I spend my summers where it's about 30 degrees cooler than Phoenix. <laughs> I understand that. You just drive up the mountain a little bit. I totally yep. understand that. And unfortunately, I'm running in between Florida and Las Vegas now because our main office is in Las Vegas. So I go from the jungle to the desert and from the desert to the jungle. It's tough on contact warriors, you know. Yeah. But let's jump in, Tom Hegna. Um, market volatility, political volatility, global volatility, volatility. We got a solution for that, right? Yeah. And I mean, look, I don't think anybody's telling anybody to put all of their money any one place, but you should have some amount of money. You know, for me, it's probably, I'm probably more conservative than a lot of people. I probably have 50 to 60% of my money into, into, you know, guaranteed products. And then I have, mm -hmm. you know, I have some real estate and I have some stocks and things like that, but, but you know, you don't get a chance to, to, to make it all over again. And, and what people don't understand is the Japanese stock market has been down for over 30 years. The European stock market was down for over 20 years. We even had a lost decade here that wasn't that long ago. I, I don't know why people think that the market is just always going to go up and up and up and up and up and up. You, you can't depend on that for your retirement. Retirement's about income. It's not about assets. I totally agree. And you're a great golfer. I'm going to say that if you want to <laughs> disagree with that. But I always tell people there's no mulligans in retirement. Can you translate that for people? Yeah, there's no dress rehearsal. There's no second chance. We got to get it right the first time. And that's why I'm trying to help people because see, Stan, I don't sell any financial products. I don't care if they buy any of the financial products. I'm trying to show them what the research of the leading PhDs and economists around the world that say as a minimum in retirement, you should cover your basic living expenses with guaranteed lifetime income. And if people would just do that as a baseline and Stan, the easiest way for a normal investor to get involved with annuities is just move their bonds. Bonds are doing nothing. And, and, the, and as interest rates go up, the value of bonds is going down. That's ridiculous. Move your bonds into an annuity. You're going to be happier. The risk is going to go down. The returns are going to go up. I mean, it's like, it's crazy that, 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 that more, you know, the Wall Street Journal should be screaming. And they did. They had an article that said they you did. should transfer your bonds into annuities. The Barons had a really good article on, sure. on annuities recently. So I think the mainstream media is starting to catch up a little bit. Tides changing because, you know, with the demographic tidal wave of people retiring or, and looking for guarantees, um, you know, it's just a good time to look at all different types of annuities. There's just not one annuity. It's like saying there's just one restaurant right. that just dri that drives me crazy. You know, we've had Wade Fowl on, we've had Moshe Molesky on, now we have Tom Hegna on. I mean, those are the three giants in our industry of talking, of talking about annuities from a non-sales level because they don't sell anything. That's the reason I love what Tom does. He he educates consumers, but he also educates advisors and agents on how to properly position all annuity types, um, transferring risk. He's a, he's a treasure. It's kind of sad, sad to me that he's not going 100 miles an hour like he used to. But, you know, he's 61. And the reason that he can transition at age 61 is he's, he, he lives the plan. You know, he's not just talking about it. He has multiple annuities in place for lifetime income. He's transferring the risk. Um, I did a re recent video, um, Tom, and I want you to comment on it. It was called, You've Won the Game, Why Are You Still Playing? Right. Weigh in on why people are still holding on to, 
well, you have to have exposure to the markets. Why is that this in the same category as, well, you have to go to college? It seems to me that's ringing hollow now. Yeah. No, and, and I always tell people, what are you trying to be, the richest guy in the cemetery? See, I don't want to be the richest guy in the cemetery. I want to live the richest life. And so, you know, you said I'm not going 100 miles an hour. I am, but I'm just not doing it 100 miles an hour in my that's, work. I'm 100 miles true. an hour at golf and pickleball. That's I'm playing true. pickleball two days a week. I'm playing tennis. Go. So, I mean, I, I'm doing the things that I want to do. And yes, is it hard for me? Because, you know, people thought I was kind of a workaholic. I wasn't, but I, mm -hmm. I'd work 80, 90 hours a week, but, but I was doing something I love to do. But now, you know, I, I lost my mom, lost my dad, lost mm -hmm. two of my golfing buddies, ah. one at 56, one at 41. Yeah. And you start realizing, hey, we don't know how long this thing's going to last. Why, why do I want to be on a staying at Marriott hotels? I, I'm lifetime platinum or lifetime sure. diamond at Hilton, lifetime platinum elite at Marriott. I've spent five years of my life, five whole years just in those two hotel <laughs> chains. Do I want to do that? No. I mean, I love to do the speaking. I love to do the training. Um, but but another thing, Stan, that's, that's interesting is as I'm doing my training, there are a whole lot of financial advisors out there who still don't get it. They say yeah. they're fiduciaries, sure. but they don't use annuities. I mean, that's ridiculous. It'd be ridiculous. How can you say you're a fiduciary doing what's right for a client in retirement and not ever bring up an annuity? I mean, that, that that's malpractice. How can they call themselves a fiduciary? So I've got those battles to fight yet, too. <laughs> and I know me and you both battle those you have those battles over social media and when we speak and and people that are under the mantra of i hate all annuities yeah and I always tell advisors well if that's the case then stop advising on social security because right. that's an, that's an annuity or stop advising someone on a pension that they're getting right. from their employer if they're, if they're so fortunate. And Stan, people love their social security. They love their pensions and right. they happen to love their income annuities. How many times have you ever got a complaint from somebody that says, stop sending me these checks. I don't like them. I've, that's None. never happened in the history of the world. None. I, I recently had um, a group of researchers on from Stan Stanford University that are, they're studied cognit cognitive decline within seniors and people, our age as well. I mean, it happens. Um, can you address that hard subject for people and, and maybe give them some tips and pointers on how to either talk with their spouse or loved one about, hey, we might want to put this turnkey solution in place for income because, you know, one out of one of us is going to die, but one out of two of us, the stats say, as, when we're in our 80s, are going to have cognitive issues. Yeah, so the, this rings very true to me because both my parents had Alzheimer's. I've taken the DNA test. I got two Alzheimer's genes. So, like, this is the real deal. And, and if, you, if you research it, what you find is over the years, many seniors, they, they don't realize they have dementia. My parents didn't right. even realize it until, it, you know, I, I think eventually they did. But at first they don't. And they just do things that don't make sense. Like, they'll do things things that in their mind make sense, but they don't make sense. And now imagine if you're doing that with an investment portfolio and you read some article somewhere that says, oh, this stock's going to go good. And you said, well, I'm going to move all my money to that stock or something. Right. People are getting wiped out. And so I think as you get older, once you get into your 70s, especially in 80s, mm -hmm. you need to consolidate. You need to have fewer financial sure. advisors. You need to have fewer products. They need to be simpler and they need to be things that you know, you almost want some surrender charges or something on there to, to protect you from yourself uh, if, if, if you do have cognitive decline. And so I think the insurance products can help people set themselves up to, to be okay. Because if an income annuity is coming in, whether you are co cognizant of it or not, it's coming in and it's not going right. to stop and you can't stop it. So those types of products are very good for people as they get in their 70s and 80s. And as you know, the payout rates are so high because of the mortality credits. They're getting right. extra money from the risk pool of the people who bought annuities and died. They're getting that money too. So, I mean, that's pretty powerful. No, it really is. Um, and I think that people are warming up to the contractual guarantees that are out here. Obviously, interest rates rising helps everything, um, whether it's a, a lifetime income annuity or a multi-year guarantee annuity for a guaranteed interest mm -hmm. rate. Um, when people approach you, uh, advisors or, or consumers, about interest rates, timing, should we wait, blah, 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 what do you tell them? Well, look, I mean, 
inflation's at 9%, you got a 30 year bond that today is under 3%. That doesn't make sense. See, if inflation's 9%, a 30 year bond should be paying 12% or something. Like you should get paid more sure. than what the inflation is. Totally so what, what that's telling me is the bond market, which is the smartest market in the world is telling me that they see something really bad on the horizon. Mm -hmm. They don't see inflation keep going up. They think that maybe the Fed's gonna knock it down and then, then we're gonna go into a recession or depression or something because that's the only reason a 30 year bond would be at 2.9% when uh, inflation's at 9.1%. Doesn't make any sense. And I tell people all the time that inflation is personal. You know, you need to look at inflation not from what the talking heads on the, uh, in the media are telling you. Look at your own situation. Are you, going, are you driving a lot? Do you have, are the kids still in the house? Are you buying milk and cereal and all that stuff? How does inflation truly affect you? Or do you have enough money that you're just watching it? And yes, you can adjust um, with any type of price hikes, et cetera. I think people, they need to shut the television off, number one. And number two, they need to rationally think about inflation and not fall for the sales pitch of these products that some agents will say, well, it adjusts for inflation. There is no such thing out there. I've always wanted to ask you this because you're such a great ambassador for the annuity industry as a whole. You have been... Um, I'm hoping if there is a Hall of Fame, you should be in it um, for, for a new, I mean, you should be recognized. I know you have been, but there, there needs to be a little bit more recon, a recognition for what you have done and the groundwork you have laid, the books you've written. And by the way, we're going to have all of those links on our site at theannuityman.com. And his site is Tom Hegna, all one word, H-E-G-N-A.com. But my question to you, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear it, what frustrates you? about the annuity industry? What has frustrated you in the past and what frustrates you going forward? Well, I mean, for, from a producer's point of view, the compliance has just gotten to be bananas crazy, right. um, the requirements. And, and but, but that happened because the industry didn't police itself very well. And like 15 years ago, there were products that were bad annuities with 20 year surrender charges. They were selling them to 85 year old women. And right. you know, they illustrated ridiculous things. So the industry kind of did it to themselves. All right. Yes, but, agree. but, but at the same time, the regulators have to realize that these products are essential for clients and they, they can't be so anti-annuity. It's almost like the regulators are run by a guy like Ken Fisher or something. You know, they, they, right. the regulators need to understand that these products are good for people. They're not bad for people. And, and then if there are bad advisors, punish them and get them out. But, but let's not put all the advisors under this mountain of paperwork. I mean, now, now I mean, if, if somebody wants to roll a 401k into annuity, there's a stack of paperwork about that high that has to be filled out. And so I think that's frustrating, the, the lack of the policing on the front end and right. then the over-policing on the back end. It's very frustrating. If Tom Hegna was czar of the annuity industry for the next five years. And that would, I would vote for that, Tom. I would be your, your assistant <laughs> czar. But um, what would you do? If you had that pen and that magic wand to change things, what would you change? You know, I, I think I would make sure that every advisor was trained properly because that's part of the reason that we had a problem. There wasn't the proper training. They just said, Hey, here's a product, go sell it to people. And instead of say, here's how you solve a problem. And Agreed. here's why this is good. And here's, here's what's guaranteed. Here's what not guaranteed. Here's what this fee is. Here's what that, you know, so that they really knew what stuff was going on. The, the, the products I think today are, are pretty darn good. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of bad product out there. I mean, I, I think, so I think, I think the products are in the right, but I mean, I think they could be a little more innovative. I would love to see, um, you know, some, some, some things that they could do, like put in a sleeve where if the market goes down, something goes up, maybe put in a crypto sleeve if to give some people some exposure to that in a, in, with some guarantees and, and I, you know, those products are harder because they're very volatile and, and, uh, but I would like to see some creativity. You know, we got to bring the millennials in. I, I think things should be more easily done on your phone and app and, you know, Hey, I want to put 50 yeah. grand more in my annuity. You, you can't do stuff like that. It's it, the yeah. industry is, is kind of still back in the sixties and seventies where everybody else is in the, you know, the 2020s. I always said when I, I first got out here and uh, decided to become the mythical annuity man, um, it, it surprised me how archaic the industry was. I called it the, uh, the model of, a, of the, the 
if you were people will remember every town had like a travel agency mm -hmm. and it was similar to that but i th do you think covid drug some of these carriers across the technology finish line do you agree with that i do i do i think it made them uh, have to do things i mean you know now companies are bragging that you can do it on you can fill yeah. out an app on a computer or phone yeah, we should have had right. that 30 years ago we some sure. companies did have it 30 years ago but i mean yeah. Yeah, so I, I do think that COVID increased the technology, but I mean, we still have a long way to go on oh, technology, I think, in our goodness. industry. Yeah, we have so many, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're the pioneer in the technology space direct to consumer, and we're approaching carriers all the time. Here's what we want to do, and they look at us like we're showing paintings to blind people. They have no yeah. idea what we're talking about. So eventually they'll catch up, but, um, but, I, but I agree. I think the technology side, if I was – czar for the day, I would certainly push the companies to go in that direction. I think they're going to be drugged across that finish line just because of consumer demand for ease of use and things like that. Uh, anyway, do you see problems in DC? I mean, DC is a mess. It always is regardless of what party you're landing on. Um, I know Secure Act 2.0 is messy. I had Bob Carlson on recently and he talked about that. What are you hearing? Because your ears are to the ground and people do talk to you. Well, you know, it's f so funny is, is you go back there and, and half of DC is working to make it harder to, for advisors to sell annuities because, uh, you know, they don't want to rip off old people and stuff. So they're working right. on that. You got half of DC that says, no, we need to add these products to 401ks. We need to get more <laughs> people into. It. And so I, I just look at this and how can two parts of a city be doing things that are exactly the opposite? I, you know, we do need to get annuities and by the way like i said i don't sell any news but you know right. you brought up uh personal inflation rate sure. dr david babble talks about that in the baby boomer dilemma he, he disclosed he had 14 mm -hmm. annuities and he started seven of them right away and then as his as his wife said all oh, things are getting more expensive then he annuitized another one and then a couple of years later he annuitized another one and so he he staggers his annuities where i've laddered my annuities mine are starting at certain dates sure. i do have some that are staggered but that however a person does it they want to set it up so that they have increasing income over time no i agree with that you know because of there's over ten thousand, ten to twelve thousand baby boomers hitting age 65 every single day obviously big money is noticing this the annuity industry is still very immature from the standpoint of sales volume and things like that it should be a multi-trillion dollar industry it's not for whatever reason we're seeing a lot of consolidation tom we're seeing a lot of um creative accounting creative structuring of life insurance companies, putting them in Bermuda, et cetera. Kerry Pector of Retirement Income Journal mm -hmm. has talked about the Bermuda Triangle of this, and mm -hmm. he's kind of sounding the alarm. What's your take on all this? Uh, because there's, it's, you know, the annuity industry is wanting to get in front of all this money in motion. Yeah, I, I you know, haven't spent my entire insurance career in AAA rated mutual companies <laughs> to see this Bermuda stuff going on. You know, a lot of warning flags are going right. off in my head. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's a lot of private equity money. And, mm -hmm. and you've just seen just in last week, there were two or three huge mergers in our industry. Big ones. Um, and and I and I happen to work with a lot of these different companies, so I'm trying to figure out what's going on because I'm not in the loop necessarily of what all is going on. But I just know there have been some huge, um, you know, mergers shocking. and acquisitions, shocking yeah, shock, ones, shocking and, ones. Uh, yeah, you know, no need one, to mention it on the because this is kind of inside baseball stuff yeah. that only Tom and I will know about, but we do know. But it's it's interesting to see what's happening. And, you know, the, the private equity, family office, hedge fund type money, big money is sniffing around because they see a lot of money going into these products. And obviously with um, interest rates rising, uh, people are now saying, OK, wait a minute, I maybe can live off the interest or maybe that that lifetime income quote is a lot better now because even though it's based on life expectancy, that interest rate is popping it just a little bit more. Um, so, so a tip maybe. Um, before you do business with some of these companies, look to see if their products are approved in the state of New York. And the only reason I say that is New York yeah. has like the strictest insurance rules and which frustrates, I, I think they're way too strict in some areas, but, but for this type of thing, I, I think, you know, I'd be looking at that and if, if they can't get a policy in the state of New York, I might be a little, uh, I might be a little concerned. Yeah. There's some, in New York has some crazy rules. Yeah. I mean, some very high, high bar levels of entry for just, it doesn't make any sense, but I agree with you that, that they do have some things that they're very hard. 
It's very tough to get your product approved. And when carriers come out with products, just for people to know, they have to go state by state for approval. So, you know, these products, especially the fixed products, are regulated at the state level. These are not SEC FINRA products. The variable annuities are and some of the buffer annuities are, but, but, but the, the fixed annuities are not. Um, what's the positives you're seeing out there with the industry? Because you speak to everybody and you're, you're, in the, you're in the rooms with the big grand poobahs. Um, what are you hearing? Well, I, I just think um, annuities are being more accepted and people are learning that the things that Ken Fisher said were wrong. And I think yeah. this stock market volatility is helping. I mean, annuity sales are at record levels or near mm -hmm. record levels. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they came out with these new uh, Ryla products that, uh, that I think yes. are, are interesting. You let's, know, let's tell people a registered index linked. Yeah, well, it's it's a variable annuity, yeah. but without the variable annuity fees, okay? Because right. um, they 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 structure it so that that there aren't really a lot of fees in the product. Um, you get most of the upside, right. you know, more than an index annuity, but then you have to take some downside. So sure, there's and floors some. and there's buffers. I don't, we don't need to get that deep it's, in the weeds. It, if yeah, and it's it's being sold improperly as everything. It's not being explained really well. I'm getting these calls and the, the explanations. I don't think the advisors, once again, they're not being trained real well. And RILA is registered index linked annuity, correct? Yeah, I mean, some people call them structured annuities. Some people buffer, call them yeah. buffer annuities, uh, whatever. But 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 the thing that's, the, especially now that the market's down 20 or 30%, mm -hmm. I think that offers a very good entry point for these products because they still protect you for another 10 or 20%, depending on, on the ones you get. And then you can get a whole lot of upside uh, on those products uh, from here. So, I, you know, I, I, I think the industry and I think the fixed indexed annuity world has cleaned up a lot i mean there's still more and to go there's, but I think there's still there's still some more mopping up but yeah. yes but, i agree but they've, with that. they've cleaned up a lot and, and some of the products are very attractive and some of the uncapped indexes have sure. performed well some haven't but some have performed very okay. well i mean i have yeah. one that did over nine percent one year i mean for yeah. a fixed product i think that's pretty darn good no absolutely but don't you think that the the focus and i was talking to motion molesky about this the focus for annuity carriers really is income and innovative income products. Don't you agree with that? I, I do think that's, that's where they're focused because that's where yeah. the baby boomer market is going. You know, I mean, that's that they need income in retirement. So I, I think, I think the income is very important. Yeah. One of the things he was pointing out, Moshe was pointing out was carriers are working on, and this is long-term, so don't call me and ask me where it is, but attaching, lifetime income to pre-existing conditions and then ramping up those payments based upon, in other words, income rider for diabetics, income rider for pre-cancer. Yeah. Well, and I, that's an interesting thought. And well, I here, like the it, thought. Yeah. Here's my, here's my experience in that. Like I was with a company that did issue medically sure. um, underwritten annuities, but that had to be over a million. Cause, but, but, but here's, here's what they found. When you do that, you have to lower the payout to the regular pool because yes. you're going to increase this pool. See, like when they just pay everybody the same, they know some people are sick, some people are well, some people are going to live long, some people aren't. So and that's then they the challenge. The rate. That's the yeah. challenge. So as that. soon as you take the high risk people out of the pool, then you got to lower the payout for the other people. Yeah, it's not. I always tell people annuity companies have the big buildings for a reason. Yeah. You know, they don't give anything away. You know, there's not, you know, you've got to be careful when it sounds too good to be true and you're nudging your spouse at the bad chicken dinner seminar. It's not too good to be true. These are contracts. You have to be very rational and pragmatic about what you're trying to do and what you're trying to solve for. Um, but I, I think it's, I, I, I see the financial journalist out there being a little bit more open to at least looking into the truth about annuities because I'm getting a lot more interviews and a lot more airtime. I'm assuming you are as well. And they're listening. They're not just assuming that they're all bad or they're all expensive or those, those mantras that's been out there that are so untrue. Um, are you seeing a shift from the standpoint of, of what the journalists are saying, even though they I, still don't know what the heck they're talking about? 
I think so. I mean, there's still some bad apples out there, yeah, you know, right and bad things. But like yeah. Barron's this this time, right. you know, in the past, Barron's has had an annuity issue. But then they always say, oh, but you got to stay. You know? yeah. But this one was really much different in tone, I felt. Mm-hmm. And I think they know that seniors should have some money and guaranteed lifetime income. And it's, you know, it's like um, Dr. Michael Finga says, there's no debate among PhDs or economists about right. if an annuity should be used. It's about what type and when. You know, and and to me, I think that's what it's coming down to. It's not that annuities are bad now. It's which annuity should you get and when should you get it and why, you know, those types of things. A lot of the agent army out there is aging out and they're getting older. And I think there's a there's a big push for, um, you know, the the legacy model of agents selling annuities, which me and you both know if, if annuity companies could figure out how not to do that, they do it in a heartbeat. But in in the meantime, um, is there an issue? Are you hearing rumblings that they're not replacing the agent army as much, or are they replacing the agent army with registered investment advisors, bank channels, brokerage channels? Well, you know what I'm seeing is since a lot of the mutuals have demutualized, mm-hmm. they're, they're not putting the money into recruiting like they did. They're, they're right. kind of going picking off the ones from the mutuals that are still out there. But then you've got this other thing that's just happened in the past three, four, five years where you've got the, the people helping people, the family first life, the, the, yeah. the, um, the, the, the world financial group. These sure. are kind of these multi-level um, organizations that are really recruiting a lot of people. OK, I mean, that's where the recruits are coming from. They're, they're building huge, huge numbers of producers because they allow them to come in part time, which brings in other dangers. So, you know, yeah. you know, about. But, but what I'm yeah. saying is that's a whole thing that wasn't happening 20 years ago. I mean, I guess there was A.L. Williams, but 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 this is a real deal now that that. And, and the other carriers are not recruiting. I mean, you got the Northwesterns, the New York Life, the Mass Mutuals and, and Guardians. They're still doing it. But outside of that, you know, there's not a lot of recruiting going on that I'm seeing. Yeah, as you know, I, I truly believe that agents are not needed. And people say, wait a minute, Stan, you're, you're an agent. But if we're selling the contractual guarantees, I think there, needs, there comes a point in time that as an industry, we can create enough layers of uh, compliance that it can almost sold, be sold direct. My goal is with my company, as you know, and I told you this a long time ago, you said I was, you didn't say I was crazy, but you looked at me like I was crazy, but I'm used to that look from my wife. So it's no big deal. Is um, I do think that eventually this will be more of a direct to consumer product. We certainly lead that way in, in all 50 states and don't meet with any clients face to face and it's all virtual. Do you see that as a trend or is that just, am I just a unicorn out here? You know, I, I just think, I think maybe at the, the higher end level where people are sophisticated and they can get on an app and they can buy it, it'll work. But I do think, you know, a lot of these products are sold. They're not bought. They should be bought, but they're yeah, not. They and and it takes somebody to make a phone call and say, hey, what would happen if, if you died right now? What happened to your family? You know, people don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I wonder what happened if I died. What would happen to my family? They don't, they don't do that. They need somebody to stimulate them. Or, or what happens if the market crash stays on for 20 years? What are you going to do? You know, where, where's money going to come from? You know, it, it, it takes somebody to kind of to shake them a little bit. I agree. Um, we actually trademarked the phrase where annuities are bought, not sold, because that's what we do. And that's what we pride yeah. ourselves on. And it's a non high pressure sales environment. But I do remember when I was with Dean Witter back in the day, Tom and Dean Witter, that's when, um, before it was absorbed by Morgan Stanley and the first direct, you could buy stocks direct like $8 a trade or whatever. You might remember that we're about the same age. And I remember the, the VP of Dean Witter flying in from New York. And I, at the time I was in some regional office and he flew in and he said the following, don't worry about that. It's not going to affect our business. It reminded me of the IBM CEO saying that he didn't see a need for um, people having computers in their home. And he saw maybe a need for five computers in the world. Again, stupid. Yeah. Are we going to look back 20 years from now, 10 years from now and go, oh man, I mean, yeah, it is direct to consumer. Can we, can we as an industry make it that simple? My, my whole thing is hopefully, um, but you're saying you still think there's going to be a layer of advice within, correct? Well, I, I, you know, look at Amazon or Google yeah. or Apple. They could come up with a direct to consumer model. Imagine if you buy your annuities on Amazon, you know, you just say, uh, people always ask me, who's my biggest threat, 
Like I don't, I don't have any threats out here in the annuity industry that I can see. I have some competitors that are honorable people and I know them well, but they certainly aren't doing what we're doing. But uh, people say, well, who would scare you? I'd, I'd Bezos. I mean, yeah. Bezos would, yeah. would, would damage the business model because they could turn it on in a, in a second. I think the only reason they don't is it's just not a big enough market and there's probably some compliance layers, but I have heard that they are, they have looked and they're looking at that, that model, especially from the life insurance side, people need to remember life insurance companies issue annuities. So yeah. the life insurance is more of a direct and consumer model already. Um, but, you know, well, and, and look what New York Life's doing through ARP. That's direct to consumer. There, there's Correct. not a New York and they've Life been doing agent. that forever. They've been they've doing, been doing, doing for that for a long forever. time. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. I remember doing a AAR speaking at an AARP national convention, and the New York Life booth was slamming. Um, but yeah, they they've been doing that a long, long time. And just so you know, that did cause some agent conflict at first because yeah, you know somebody sure. was a client and the agent mm -hmm. was talking to them and then they ended up buying direct. And but mm -hmm. um they worked out some ways to mitigate that with with the agents. And so it they're they're living that right now with uh, both sides and with very little conflict. Very little conflict. Um well so the that big brokers can, firms can that work. Too. Yeah the big brokers firms did that too. Merrill Lynch does that where you can buy Merrill Direct. Um, or you use the the highfalutin advisors in the marble office. I mean, you know, things things are changing, and I do think as this generation, the older generation, passes away, dies off, that with each coming generation, um, you know, they're they're a little bit more technology savvy. You know, I remember when I started first doing YouTube videos, and I do more YouTube videos than anybody in the annuity space by a mile. People say, well, it's not going to work because people don't watch videos. Older people, I'm like, you want to you want to bet? I mean, I really believe that. I don't think, I think the seniors are technology savvy and they're, they're saying bring it on in most cases. My well, I mean, think about mom, it. I, I had to work on my garage door opener one day. Where do I go? I go to YouTube. I type in the model number. Yep. And there's somebody there telling me how to fix my garage door opener. So, I, I mean, I use it all the time. And, you know, I've got hundreds of uh, YouTube videos as mm -hmm. well. And, and I get... I get people from around the world that watch those oh, things and then they'll absolutely. comment or they'll ask a question or something. It's crazy. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, at the time of this tape and we have six, over 600, we do 25 a month and we just, we just crank them out based upon what people want to hear. Um, what's the boogeyman for the annuity industry that we're not thinking about right here that could, that could really hurt things because these are confidence products. Yeah, I mean, you know, if there was a significant market black swan that nobody saw or something that 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 caused significant financial damage mm -hmm. to the bond market or things that, you know, insurance companies own. Yep. Um, but I, I've always said if, you know, when something really bad happens, what you're going to want is you're going to want guns, bullets, water, and toilet paper, and toothpaste. You know, that's, that's a, true. if it gets so bad, you're not going to worry about that. You're going to worry about this other stuff. I mean, if there was a war, if there was a, you know, major, major meltdown, or if one of these, you know, hedge funds went bust and a bunch of insurance people or London, the companies sure. went under and then, sure. you know, the whole industry got tarred with that. That yeah, could be definitely. bad. I mean, so there yeah. are, there are things out there that could happen, but you know what? Um, I, I still have the majority of my money in the life insurance industry, and I, I think it's the safest place for me to have mine. So that's that's the decision I've made. When people ask you about state guarantee funds, obviously we can't, as an industry, use that in a sales presentation for obvious reasons. It's not FDIC insurance. It's not as strong as that. What do you tell people about state guarantee funds and how to view that when positioning themselves in annuities? I mean, you know, it's it's a nice to have, you know, I mean, if, if you have 250 or 300,000, depending on the state per contract mm -hmm. per person or whatever, I mean, maybe if you're going to buy five annuities, you put them at 300, 300, 300, 300 with different carriers or something. Sure. I mean, it's just another level. Is it going to be there? I, I think it might be because they, they, mm -hmm. they assess all the insurance companies. There's money there to help protect. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I th just think it is another level of protection. I, I don't talk about it in any of my talks, but you know, I'm yeah. aware of it. And, yeah. and, uh, and I think, uh, I think it's just another level of protection. I tell people it's like going to your, your um, family reunion and your uncle Fred's there and he has on suspenders and a belt. Yeah. 
just to make sure, you know, <laughs> right. it's, belts, it's belt and suspenders. Yeah, um, that's right. But I always tell people, if you're going to buy an annuity of any type, you base your decision on the claims paying ability of that carrier and the type of annuity that you're buying. So if you're buying a lifetime income stream, you need to step up the plate and, and, and get a solid company. There could be some, some specific situations that carriers at a little bit less than A plus rated could make sense at a short, shorter term duration. MIGAs, I know that we look at that from that claims paying ability. I really tell people you're either going to marry them or you're going to date them. If we're going to date them, we're going to analyze it differently than if we're going to marry them. But, um, you know, th these are confidence products. And I do think there's some self-policing within the industry that's positive. I wanted to pivot because in the past we have talked about crypto and you do have some in your portfolio on a personal basis. But you did mention early in the podcast that the possibility of crypto entering the annuity space, that just seems a little far off to me, but maybe not. What do you think? Well, it might be far off. And, and as far as crypto, I've only said 1% of a portfolio. That's what you, you I did do. say that. 1%. You did say so that. I'm not saying put 30%, no, 20%, please, 50%. Please no, don't. I said please 1% because 1% if it goes to zero isn't going to hurt me. But if it goes to a million bucks of Bitcoin, it'll help me. And that's why I, I that's why I keyed on the 1%. What I would like about, you know, I could imagine a fixed index annuity or something like that that had a crypto sleeve that had no downside risk gives you some upside of the market. I mean, I think it would be interesting. I, I just don't know because it's so volatile. I think yeah. the options would be so expensive that they'd it have would. to put the cap pretty low and then it, then it would, then it wouldn't, then it wouldn't work. You'd want something that you could make a lot and not lose, you know, that's, that, that's, that's what you'd want. But uh, you know, I think we're a ways off from that because, because of the volatility of it, the, the, the premiums for, to protect that would be pretty high. But me and you both know that if something like that came out, just just because it would be so new, they'd sell it to death. I mean, it would be. Well, would I mean, be I think it would capture the millennials and the generation X, Y, Z. I don't know if the baby boomers would put a lot of money in it, but you know, the younger people might. I, you know, it's just it's just interesting. Maybe it would start in a variable before it go to index. I don't know, and I'm sure they'd have to put limits that you can't put more than three percent or five percent or whatever. Sure. Right? You wouldn't you wouldn't want somebody to put a hundred percent in crypto in an annuity, and then they'd be bashing annuities for the rest of their lives because the crypto didn't perform. You know. When people are looking at annuity types, and I always say they primarily solve for four things, principal protection, income for life, legacy, long-term care, just an easy acronym pill. What do you tell people to be aware of as they're shopping? Um, are there any, anything from the, because our, most of our listeners are consumers across mm -hmm. the country. What would you tell them going into, you know, if they're, if they're new to the annuity industry, what to start looking for? So uh, I, I look at it this way. When I, when I buy annuities, I own 11 of them. Number mm -hmm. one, I want to know the company's strong. I want, and, mm -hmm. and everybody can have their level of strength. I have mine sure. pretty set pretty high. But yeah. you want to deal with a strong carrier. You want to have um, a good rate. You, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to buy a junkie product. You, you want to know what your fees are. Are there mm -hmm. fees or not fees? Most annuities are not fee products. A lot of people don't know that. Right. But you want to know, are there surrender charges? Are there fees? Are there hidden fees? What are, you know, disclose all the fees, you know, and then uh, I, I don't even know if you can do that without using some sort of software, you know, whether it's, you know, um, uh, what's CanX or, you know, there's sure. this duties genius. There, there, there are software out there that you can say, I'm a male, I'm 61. Annu annuity rate watch. Yeah, yeah those, I have $100,000. Yeah. I'm interested in income or I'm interested in growth, whatever. And right. you push a button and now it lists the carries. And you say, I only want to deal with a carrier that's right. A rated above or whatever. Right. You put that in, boom, now it narrows it. I don't want to have any fees. Boom, that narrows it. I, I won't have a surrender charge over five years, whatever. Yeah. You put yeah. in the parameters and now you're dealing with eight or 10 instead of 8,000. Right. No, I agree. I agree with that. Do you think back in the day and a few years back, there was some pending legislation and carriers kind of overreact and said, okay, all agents need to list and show their commission. We eagerly and happily did that. We do that anyway. Um, even though all annuity commissions are built into the product paid from the reserves and it's a net transaction to you. Do you think that would help the industry from a perception standpoint for, for agents to, be required agents advisors to be required to show the compensation I, you know i'm not against it i i just i don't since the compens since the compensation does not come out of the client's you know pocket sure. I, i'm less inclined to say it's an issue because you know yes the price the the 
product is priced to pay the commission, but the commission right. doesn't come out of the client's hundred thousand dollars if they put. And and right. yet the, all kinds of these financial advisors who hate annuities say, oh, the fees are high. They're going to take so much money out of your account. I They're know. not taking a single penny out of your account. So so that bugs me. Um, but I do think there needs to be transparency. I do yeah. think people need to know what they're buying. I, I hope that the financial advisors who aren't using annuities show how many millions of dollars they're going to charge in fees over the lifetime of their business, which they're not sure. showing that right now. They'll show, oh, we charge 1%. Well, 1% plus this, plus this, plus, and then you multiply that out over 30 or 40 years. They're going to pay a lot of money in fees to those other advisors as well. Well, and I also tell people that annuities, all types, don't, there's not just one type. Uh, like when people come in, what's the best annuity? I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, you have to answer two questions with us. What do you want the money to, you know, what do you want the money to contractually do? And when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? But I do think the annuity industry has one thing that no other product has that sets it apart that no one really talks about, but it's me and you. And it's the free look, free look period. You literally can buy it or be pressured into buying something and get out of it without any type of, you don't have to give any type of reason you just call the annuity company and say i'm within the free look time period send me my money back and without hesitation without hesitation every single carrier will do that shouldn't that be something we kind of wear on our sleeve a little bit more as an industry well you know when i was an advisor i would say that to people i say look you know you're not making a final decision today let's get the paperwork in and, and you do have a free look provision and whether sure. that it's different i think by state and by product it used to be sure. you know 30 days and i think it's 21 days i don't even know how many days but you do have a, a, a pretty long time that you can review the contract make sure it's going to do what you want it to do but but i think if the product is positioned properly up front like i did not have hardly any free looks in, a, in in my no. entire career so absolutely we don't you know yeah um because i i tried to position it and so people knew what they were buying and then that there was no hocus pocus here here's what it is here's yeah. what it does here's why it does it here's why it, what it'll do for here's you here's the benefits, why I have it. here's the limitations yeah. everything yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. you know if it's if it's framed properly there's not going to be a lot of free looks one thing I was going to ask you about too, because most, most of the fixed annuity space, which is MIGAs and SPIAs and DIAs and QLACs, there's no nuance. I mean, those are straight contractual guarantees. They're very simple to understand. You can explain them to a nine-year-old, no offense to nine-year-olds. But where a lot of the industry gets this bad reputation is in the index annuity space, because it is one of the higher commission products out there. We sell a ton of them just because we use them as a delivery system for income benefits, if that's what you need. We're, but there's a lot of nuance in the selling process with, with the index annuity space. How would you clean that up? Is there some type of procedure or protocols that you would put in place to clean up index annuity sales? Because the majority of calls that I get from dissatisfied customers are people that have purchased these under false and misleading hopes and dreams. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, the thing about the index space is there there is complexity because you've got yeah. different um, caps, you've got different, um, uh, you know, Spreads, point to point, you know, yeah. two year, yeah. three year, one year. There's you got 750 indexes. plus yeah, index different indexes. Choices. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, again, where I think if you had software to help filter it out. And I mean, yeah. I don't think the industry needs 700 indexes. I don't think they, they do. don't, you know, let's take the hundred best ones over the past yeah. 10 years or something, yeah. use those or something. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, so, so there, there, and then there's surrender charges and then there's some optional riders and you know, sure. then there's a, there's an index income base and then a benefit base. I mean, and up, upfront bonuses really get in the way too. Yeah. Because so, those are missold. Um, I don't know what to do with that other than it's sad because I always tell people I'm not down on index. They're, 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 they're a good product. They're just not too good to be true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I think you're right by selling the contractual guarantees. If you get more than that, great, but great. here's what you can count on. Let's count that as extra. That's the play check. This is the paycheck. Let's make sure we get the paycheck covered. If you get some extra play checks, that's okay. And by the way, he just mentioned his book, play checks and paychecks. Oh, that's one of them. Yeah. That's, and it's the a, yeah one of, that's the one that I really like. Um, all of them are good, but that's the one I, re I read on the plane one time. I said, I got to track Tom Hegna down. What the heck? Um, but we'll have all those links on our site to where you can buy those books. And if you're a consumer, those are kind of must reads um, as you go into chapter two of your life and retirement, you know, it is somewhat of a part-time job to do it right. 
and to make sure that you're making decisions on your terms and your time frame, et cetera. What else is going on with you, Tom? Well, you know, for 30 years, I got paid for what I did. Now I get paid for what I know and who I know, kind of is what it is. <laughs> and, and so, but I did, I did a meeting today in, or I guess it was yesterday in Chicago, but I was here and they had everybody there at the meeting. They had some yeah. live speakers and then yeah. I came in through virtual and that's what I'm doing because what we've done is I've raised my in-person way up because I just don't want to be on the road. And when, yeah. you know, when they, we tell them the price, they go, that's crazy. And like, well, he'll tie in virtually for a lot less than that. And so we've shifted it. <laughs> And, and it's really been working. And so I'm doing most of it virtual and like yeah. I'm doing, I, I'm doing webinars today. I'm doing stuff sure. and then I can still go and hit the golf ball a little bit, you know, if I need to. So there's a Learjet pricing model for Tom Hegna. <laughs> no, I like that. I'm, Here's the Learjet package. You want the uh, Learjet package, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, CEO, you know, That's I really want to fly private, but I've, I just can't <laughs> make the numbers work. Like I couldn't make the numbers work in my, for country clubs while I was working. Now the country club numbers work, but the, but they do say, if you don't fly first class, your kids will. So, <laughs> so my I wife and tell I on our last that. trip, we booked first class to Hawaii. I always <laughs> tell people that my kids are going to like helicopter into my funeral and then drive <laughs> off in a Lamborghini. Yeah. Um, that's for sure, especially my youngest one who uh, lives in Manhattan and, and loves that kind of life. And, but then again, I provide it for her. So, um, Tom, it's, it's been great having you on. I do have one last question. As you know, with every, every time you're on, there's one last question. It's called the mic drop moment. No pressure at all to be fantastic. But, um, you know, words of wisdom as we go out at the time of this tape, and we're typically a few weeks out before it releases, but it's a little chaotic, but uh, words of wisdom to the people out there that that are either thinking about retirement, already in retirement, contemplating retirement, or just planning for it. What would you tell them? So here's a simple four steps, and that, that's how Paychecks and Playchecks ends. There you go. Number one, cover your basic living expenses in retirement with guaranteed lifetime income. Correct. Number two, optimize the rest of your portfolio to protect yourself against inflation. Number three, you must have a plan for long-term care. No retirement plan is complete without a plan for long-term care. It's the one thing people forget about that wipes them out. And number four, the most efficient way to pass wealth to children, grandchildren, charities, uh, and spouses is with life insurance. I tell people all the time, don't leave your kids any money. You're supposed to spend all your money, leave them life insurance. You can do that for pennies on the dollar. So those are the ways to get the most for the least in retirement. That's a good news. I, and that's, that's a, that's a very good way to end it. I always tell people life insurance is the best return on investment you will never see right? because you will be dead. <laughs> and that's the motivation from Stan, the annuity man. I want to thank everybody that's listening to us on all the major podcast platforms and all the people watching us on the fund with annuities, YouTube channel, thanking Tom Hagno once again for gracing us with his presence. He is fantastic. He's one of my favorite people, if not my favorite person in the annuity industry. And I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get and that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of so join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet fun with annuities